Good morning and afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Friday Fast Track Hangout. Happy Friday, everyone. I'm Wayne Griffenberg. I'm the CAD CAM Applications Engineer at Autodesk. And today we're here to talk about some of the Inventor HSM. I call it essentials, but we're going to walk through those same basics we did before. Um, a few weeks ago, we did a webinar where we uploaded a vice into Fusion. We downloaded it, uploaded a SolidWorks vice into Fusion, turned it into an assembly. We were able to design up a part real quick and uh, put some tool pass on it. Um, and following that, we had a lot of questions from our community who are Inventor HSM users. And they were asking if we can make a video or, or a walkthrough on how to do the exact same process uh, inside of Inventor. So as I had mentioned in that uh, presentation that the same workflow we can do inside of Inventor that we can inside of Fusion. And today I'd like to walk you through that process on how to do it. So, so let's do it live. Instead of uh, making a video, we're going to walk through it together. And uh, again, um, I want to make sure that we know that uh, this, uh, this set of uh, webinars that we do is not really just us talking at you, not presenting information on one side. This is a, a conversation that we'd like to have with you uh, in our community, uh, makers and machinists and, and uh, high-level uh, developers and fabricators who are uh, joining us each week. Um, you guys have a lot of experience, and to have you join this conversation, um, help us uh, to, to grow this community and help us learn uh, together. So anytime that you guys have any questions or if you want to add into the conversation, please feel free. Use the chat area, the question area to type your questions and, and share with the team. So it's always good to have this conversation going. And uh, so again, please join in. And so I'd like to ask a couple questions for the, the members who are new to our webinar. Uh, before we dig in and get started with it, um, I wanna, we would like to get some feedback from you to know where you are in our community and ways that we can help you grow as a business. So a couple of the poll questions we often ask in our webinar is just to get a good idea of what's going to help you drive the growth in your business. So if you could just take a minute or so and please re uh, a poll, answer the, a couple poll questions so just to just let us know where you are in your industry. Uh, so we can uh, get more content out there for you. We can drive these webinars uh, to talk about these uh, uh, these important features that we would have in our CAD CAM interface that can help you guys grow as a business. It also helps us get the feedback to our developers too to know where they can uh, spend some time, focus on development in our CAD CAM interfaces uh, that will help you grow your business. So looks like uh, we have a good amount of you voted. Thanks, guys. And I'm going to share that. It looks like we have um, a good 40% who are looking for some true four, uh, fifth axis um, uh, functionality in our software to be able to do uh, a lot of that, um, the, the simultaneous and true fourth and fifth. Uh, and it looks like we have 30% who are really looking to grow in more of the two to three axis machining. And then it looks like 10% across on turning uh, positioning. Uh, or indexing and uh, a mortar jet. So thanks for sharing that information. It helps us. We, we do collect that information to help to drive these webinars, to drive our online content, to even drive some of those classes that you guys will attend at Autodesk University. And uh, speaking of which, um, I'd like to ask another question of you. Uh, if you have been to Autodesk University, um, this is a great experience for you guys to, to meet other elite users, power users, our Autodesk staff, people who uh, develop our product, our, our, our uh, product developers in the CAD and CAM side, as well as machinists, um, power users, and, uh, and uh, our elite users out there in the field. You get to, uh, to meet some of those. It's a great networking experience, and you can learn from the classes that they are going to provide at Autodesk University. So I'm going to close that. Thanks, guys, for taking a, a few minutes to vote. And I'm going to share this with you. And it looks like 38% uh, is looking of how we can get there. And, and we're going to have a slide uh, or some information on we knew, we do have a, a new challenge in Instagram. If you follow our teams and you follow uh, Autodesk, you can see that uh, we have a, a large community of users. Uh, Kurt Chan and Al have released the latest uh, CAM challenge. So I, I highly recommend going and check that out. 
And if you win the CAM challenge, you can get a ticket and a seat out there at Autodesk University. So that would be part of the prize uh, for you guys and in some incentive to, uh, to get out and start to design and show people what you guys can do uh, and win some prizes for it. So thanks for, for providing that information, letting us know where you're at as far as Autodesk University. A little bit more information about that um, as I walk through um, some programs that we're doing this year. Uh, as you see, uh, Al and, and Garen Gardner are working on some programs for Autodesk University. So if you attend, uh, we have our product innovation platform. I'll take you all the way through designing, developing, coming up with that napkin sketch for a PC board as well as a speaker. So you can design the enclosure, 3D print, and machine and go through the whole process of our innovation platform uh, through Fusion. Also, we have the full track CAM classes where you can go and learn from our top users as well as our elite and Autodesk users who, who uh, uh, created some classes. You guys voted for them. Uh, they generated some great classes uh, for you guys to attend to learn the whole gamut of our software and the power of how we work with machining and CAM. And also our CAM Fast Track. Um, this is the fast tracks that we've been doing all year. We've, we've had hand-on seminar or hands-on seminars as well as our webinars to help build up some of those classes and now you can get certified throughout all those projects that you've been working on with 2D milling, 3D milling, multi-axis, uh, all the way up to doing live tooling. And then we do a live on-machine on demo there for you to get certified. So this is what's one of uh, some of the classes that are happening uh, this year at Autodesk University. Here's a sneak preview of that project, that innovate, uh, product innovation platform, uh, what the class is going to look like, developing a speaker that you can bring home, put on your desk, plug your iPhone or your, your Droid phone into. And you're going to have hands-on throughout that entire process of, of generating it and creating that, that model at the end. For the uh, certification series, these are some of the teachers. You're going to meet Derek Goodwin, uh, Kevin Lee. He's going to be on one of our future webinars coming up uh, in the uh, near future. Uh, Angelo or Angelo Juras, he'll, he's from Pier 9. He'll also be here. But he's going to be at Autodesk University teaching the 3D CAM class. Uh, CJ Abraham, uh, we know CJ. He's also at Pier 9, a product manager out there. Um, he's also going to be doing multi-axis milling. And Kevin Ellingson another power user, an elite user, uh, out there teaching turning. So this is going to be the certification class that you guys can join and, uh, and uh, meet these guys and learn and uh, get certified. So just some of our speakers. Uh, a lot of these names are very familiar if you've uh, been with us on our webinars as well as uh, uh, being out there in our Instagram uh, community and the machining community, you recognize some of these names. And Rob Lockwood will be speaking, as well as John Saunders. Seth Madour, Lawrence, and Amish will be there as well. Uh, Al Watmo, our, our CAM product manager, our software architect, uh, Renee, and uh, Marty Deans and Tim Paul, uh, our, our, adoptive, our adoption team, will be at Autodesk University as well. Uh, Lars Christensen, we see him every week. He does his Lars Live. You get to meet these guys, and just think of all that knowledge that will be in that room right here uh, that you guys can meet and talk to these guys and learn and uh, start a good conversation and just network. Um, it's a great experience, so I highly recommend joining us at Autodesk University. So getting back, it looks like uh, we're, we're starting some uh, some questions. It looks like our our team is uh, is, is, is sending us stuff about uh, AU and, and uh, ways we can get there. Uh, are you guys able to see my screen? It looks like uh, we have some feedback. Ah, uh, guys, it looks like I apologize. I was going through some screens, and it looks like it wasn't being presented. In fact, it's not the right screen. Sorry, guys. I apologize for that. But I'm glad you guys were able to see the poll questions and were able to see that pop up. You get to see my, uh, my ugly mug up there on the screen. So that's good. Hopefully you guys can see it now. Awesome, guys. Thanks. So thanks for, uh, for feeding that back. I, would, I didn't want to keep going uh, and have you guys not being able to see my screen. Okay, so I'm going to have a few slides up here uh, just to give you guys a, a bit of a primer, but the most of it's going to be us walking through. Um, so I just had some screens up there that I, I was showing what the speaker looked like um, and what those faces look like of those guys who are going to be with us uh, this year at Autodesk University. And this is what that speaker is going to look like. 
at least the initial design, but it's up to you guys what the final product's going to look like because you're going to design it when you join us there. Okay, so this way you guys can get to see those screens, and those are the, some of the faces you, of the people you're going to meet uh, when you join us at AU. Cool. Okay, guys, so as I had mentioned, um, we started off a few weeks ago, and I showed you how to download a Kurt Weiss uh, from Kurt uh, Workholding website. And uh, you can get the uh, Orange Vices as well as um, Chick Vices from their website, Mighty Bytes. I know Tim Paul was walking through uh, in a webinar uh, where he gets a lot of his um, the Mighty Bytes and different uh, types of work holding, fifth axis. And you can download a lot of those models. And we've had an uh, intern team at Pier 9 developing a lot of those models that they put right inside of Fusion. So as you're working with Fusion, you'll see uh, a large section of those models that you can get to work holding uh, in the CAM samples as well. So, um, but in the meantime, I'm working in Inventor today. A lot of users want to be able to download their fixtures, even design them, and uh, be able to turn them into assemblies that they can use as templates, just like we did in the Fusion design. So I'm going to walk through that with you today, but I'm just giving you guys a refresher. So we downloaded the Kurt Vice, uh, uploaded it into Fusion, and it translated on the cloud. So we were able to upload it and work with it directly and uh, turn it from a single body model, and we turned it into an assembly. And I'll walk through that process on how to do that so that we can save it as a template to be able to bring a part in. Uh, then we designed a simple part uh, in Fusion, drew it up, and we brought it into that assembly. And, uh, and we're able to uh, put some mates on it, put it in the assembly, and then set it up and put some toolpaths on it really quick. And at the end, of course, uh, within that hour, we we're able to get some code, post-process of some code. We're able to, uh, to get some code we can send over to the machine, made some changes to the model, and we showed how that code is automatically updated in the model. So I'm going to walk through all those steps with you today, but we're going to do it inside of Inventor. So I have Inventor 2018 um, using uh, HSM, uh, Inventor HSM, uh, the latest that we, can, uh, that we can walk through today. So there was a few of users out there who had requested. So instead of making some videos and putting them on our website, I wanted to walk through with you live today and show you those steps on how to do it. All right, so let's get started. So I'm going to bring up my inventor. And uh, for a lot of the Fusion users, a lot of this will look familiar. There's going to be some differences, some, and I'll point those out. Uh, places when we work with the model and we upload it, and uh, we're using AnyCAD and uh, either translating it or linking the models, and you'll see uh, a very similar workflow uh, that you would follow inside of Fusion. And again, any, anytime you guys have any questions or if you want to add to the conversation, please feel free. I'll keep an eye on the questions over here. Um, and uh, I'll try to get an answer. If I don't have one, I'll definitely get one for you guys. Cool. Let me expand this down a little bit so I can see your questions. Cool, guys. All right. So let me uh, let me bring up my inventor. So I'm in Inventor, and we're going to download that Kurt Vice, and I'm going to do that live for you right here. So I'm going to go into my Google. I'm just going to type in my Kurt, if I can spell. There's our D810. We downloaded it before. I'm going to go into the same place right here, Kurt Workholding, and we're going to download that Kurt Vice like we have set up on the machine. So if I scroll down to the bottom of the screen, I can see a preview of what that Kurt Vice looks like, and I can also download it from different model types as well. So I can download, if we want to get it directly into Inventor, we can. There's an Inventor SAT model here. Um, we have uh, SolidWorks assemblies, uh, a lot of different types you can download, IGIS files, parasolids, uh, even mechanical desktop files, solid edge, step files. So you can download a lot of different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, versions of um, uh, CAD files. I'm going to download the SolidWorks version. So I'll keep it on SolidWorks 2017. I don't want to zip it. You can download it as a zip model, but I'm going to download it just as it is. I'll hit download pretty quickly and now I can click the this uh, little link here and it saves it into my downloads folder so I can take a look looks like I downloaded a couple of them and later on we're going to download some parts as well so there's the part we're going to upload in fact I already have one in there but that's okay 
I'm going to show you how to work with it inside of Inventor. So using AnyCAD, I'm just going to go to open. I have a project called AnyCAD Workflow where we're going to bring that part into as well as the, uh, the part we're going to make. Uh, so I'm going to go to open. And in my downloads folder, I'm going to switch this over to look at all the SolidWorks parts. So it's just a simple solid part. It's not an assembly. It downloaded as a SolidWorks part. So I'm going to select that part and open. And this is our AnyCAD interface that pops up right here. So our AnyCAD interface gives us an, oops, here it is. It gives us a, uh, an uh, overview of what the part is. We can see uh, if we're going to bring in any solids or surfaces. Um, and we can convert the model that we can bring into Inventor or we can link it. So when you do a reference model, means that it's going to keep a link to the original SolidWorks part or Pro E part or Solid Edge part, whatever you downloaded, it'll keep a link to that part. And if that part does change, you can get the latest version and you'll see it pop up inside of Inventor that the original part that you uh, brought through AnyCAD has changed. And it'll bring those changes right inside of Inventor. So that's what happens if you use a reference model. In this case, we're going to convert it into a model that's going to become inventor parts. So I'm not really worried about keeping a link to the vice. I'm going to use it and it's going to become a template inside of my inventor. So I'm going to say OK. I'm going to leave it as a converted model. Uh, I can choose whether I want to have any meshes that come through or any other work features. I'm going to say OK. And it goes through and it quickly gives me this multi-body model. The same way we did it inside of Fusion, we're doing it here inside of Inventor. So these are individual bodies. They're not really uh, components at this point. So if I expand down, I can see the solid bodies uh, themselves, but they're not individual components. In other words, each component doesn't have an origin, so I can't move it around, and there's not much I can do with it um, as far as being able to make it an assembly. But also I notice when it comes in, I like to work with my XYZ plane matching the way I have it set up in the machine. So if I rotate this around, you see, th there's my triad down here. If I rotate it around the way I like to see it, my y-axis going into the machine, my x-axis going across back and forth, and my z-axis going up. So I'd like to see that on this Kurt Weiss. I want this edge right here to be my x-axis, this edge to be the y-axis, and this edge to go along the z. So that top corner right there of the fi of this fixed jaw plate that's what I'd like to have as my origin. You don't have to do it this way. I just like to set it up this way, and I'm going to walk through how you do that. Again, we did this a few weeks ago in Fusion, and we're going to do it today here in Inventor. So what I want to do is I want to orient the way my origin is set up the way I want to see it, my Y that way, my X, and my Z. I want to keep that because now when I move the part, I don't get lost. I can see the direction I want those components to be. So to be able to do this, I can't just right click, I can't grab the origin, grab these bodies. It doesn't give me a move command or rotate command. What I have to do is use my direct modeling to do that. So when it brought in the, the assembly, um, it, or in, the, in this case, just a model, it sees it as just one model, just a multi-body model. So I can do direct editing. I can pull faces. I can go up here to direct. If I go to direct, it opens up this direct uh, uh, dialog, if you will, this menu. And I can do things. I can resize some faces, or I can resize bodies, scale, rotate. And this is where I want to do that initial rotate of the part. So I'm going to switch over to rotate. And I don't want to rotate faces. I want to rotate solids. So I want to rotate all those bodies. Now, one thing it won't do, it won't let me select the bodies out of the browser today. So I can't go into the browser, I can't select any of these bodies directly, but I can put a window around the entire assembly and it grabs all those bodies, all those solids. If I expand down, you can see it selected them all. Okay, so now, I, since I'm doing rotate, now I have the three axes of which I can rotate. The first thing I want to do is I want to rotate it around what I call now is the x-axis, but I want that to rotate around there. So I'm just going to grab that little handle I'm going to start to rotate it around 90 degrees. So now I have it sort of slammed at the top of the table there. I'll do the same thing 
right? So now I can go and I can, I can change that handle. I can go and rotate. I hit this little plus and it accepts that rotation. So now I could do the same thing. Which solids? I'm going to select those same solids. I'm going to rotate it. This time I want to go around the Z axis. So I'm going to select that little Z axis handle. I'm going to rotate it around 90 degrees. And now I have it matching my X, my Y, and my Z where I want it. So I hit the blue plus here. So I just want to direct, open this up. I want to rotate, and now I'm rotating those solid bodies. So now it's matching my X, Y, and Z plane the way I want it. Now, I also want to put my origin on that top corner. So I'm going to exit out of here for a second. I want that little top corner right there, that point, to be at the origin. So it's a little tricky this way. Uh, Fusion, it's a little bit quicker and easier, but I'm going to walk through that step of how to do it. So I'm going to go up to my origin and expand this down a little bit, not my third party. Uh, here it is. Shrink this up. So here's my X, Y, and Z planes, or my axes, my X... Uh, X, Y, and Z axes, and my center point. They're kind of, they're turned off right now, but I can easily right click and turn on visibility. So all I did was I turned on this little point right here. That's where the center, or, or shall I say my origin, the way the model came in, that's where it sat my origin. Here's what I would do to be able to get these bodies to that origin right there. So again, I'm going to go up to direct edit, and this time I'm going to go to move instead of rotate going to select all those bodies. Now as I'm working from the top down, I'm moving, I selected the bodies, now I want to locate the point where I want to move those bodies from. So right here I'm going to locate, it says change triad location, and I'm going to select that little point right on the corner. It gives you an option on which face you want to have it adhere to. Uh, from my point of view it's okay, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you can, you can tell what I want the Z to be this direction or whatever. I'm just going to select that corner I'm going to use those three arrows in the triad to reposition the model. So the first thing I want to do is I want to be able to move from that position and I want to snap to that origin. So if I start to grab it, let's say I go along my X and it keeps a snapshot of where I'm moving from and I actually want that position to snap to my origin. So I'm going to go up here and say snap to, there's my origin, I select the origin, and now it snapped the X to the origin there. Okay, I'm going to hit the plus because that's where I want to keep it. Um, actually, I shouldn't have done that because I want it to stay in there. Um, that's okay. I can always start it back up again. So I'm going to grab those same bodies. I'm going to go and locate it again right there in the corner. And now I can see my origin right down here. So I want to snap, let's say, my Y direction, and I want that to snap to that origin right there. And now it moves it over. I can do the same thing for the Z. I could take that Z and I want it to snap to that origin right there. And now I move the body over. It took three steps because I had three axes to move. It wasn't a direct move from point to point. Um, there may be a way, you guys probably know, but this is, seems to be the best way I know to be able to move it. But if you guys have a good way, please chime in and, uh, and let me know. Uh, that would be awesome. So, uh, and you can let our, everyone know a good way to do that. So I'm going to hit apply, and now I moved our, our assembly. It will become an assembly, but I moved our vice. Now it's in the correct orientation, the way I like to see it, and it's, it, the origin is exactly in the place where I'd like to have it. So I'm going to exit out of the direct modeling, and, uh, and so I'm going to check and see if you guys have any questions or anything else uh, up here. It looks good cool guys. So now we have this multi-body model in position that we'd like to see it. Now I want to turn it into an assembly because I want to be able to move this moving jaw according to the way it sits according to this jaw here. Uh, the same way we did it in Fusion, uh, I, I, what I did is I adhered a, a coordinate system to the center of this jaw. I'll do the same thing to this jaw as well. But before we can, we have to turn this into an assembly, right? So um, right now I have these multi-bodies. I don't have a way to move these parts. It looks like it's still seeing the old one up there, and that's okay, because once I get an update, it'll be okay. So now what I want to do is I want to turn this into an assembly. So what I have to do is I'm going to go over to our Manage uh, tab here, and in the Manage tab, there's a, a function where we could say Make Components from that multi-body. So I'm going to select Make Components, 
And again, this is the uh, this is the tool that comes up. I don't have a chance to use the browser here, so I'm going to work off the graphics. I'm going to work off all the bodies in the graphics view. So it's saying, what do you want to select? What bodies do you want to turn into an assembly? Well, I'm going to put a box around my entire assembly here, and it added all those solid bodies to this group. Okay, and it's saying, insert those components into a target assembly. I can give that target assembly a name. Okay, and I'm going to give it a name called Kurt Template. You can call it Kurt Machining Template or however you want to name it. So I'm going to call that Kurt Template. It will be a standard assembly, and this is where it's going to save the assembly in my workflow, in my Inventor AnyCAD workflow project. Okay, I'm going to go to Next. It gives me a chance to rename those solid bodies if I wanted to. Um, let me expand this a little bit. So it gives you a chance that you can go in here and have these are your selected bodies. It gives it the same name, and you can see it's going to become an inventor part now. So it's going to convert them into inventor parts that we can go back and start to work with. You can give them names here. You could change the name easily in here. I'm going to leave them the way they are, but you can say, you know, fix draw and you know, the, the fix draw screw and so forth. I'm going to leave it the way it is, but you can easily do that. Uh, and I'm going to hit apply. And in the background, you'll see a new tab open up and we have a new assembly. The box stays open in case we want to do that again. We can. I'm going to cancel out. And now I have my Kurt template. And now I have this Kurt template assembly. Now you see each of these components now have an origin that we can now move each component. And of course, every origin, every uh, component is now linked to that same origin. So the zero of every one of these linked components is going to be that top corner right there that we selected to be our origin. Okay, so now we're not completely assembly. I can grab these parts, well, not quite yet. But I can take these parts and do stuff with them because now they each have their own origin and uh, definition of a, of a solid body. And they're all inventor parts. Now, as you notice, when it came in, I have this little push pin, which means they're all grounded. All the components are grounded, which means I can't move them. They're fixed in the place according to that origin. I have a moving jaw here, and I want to unground the moving jaw. I want to make those become... Uh, movable. So I'm going to select those components out of the list. So I'm going to grab this component. I'll hit my control key, grab this one. Uh, I believe I want to grab this one here. And then I want to get the 13 and 14 bolts. And I want those to no longer be grounded. So I'm going to right click. And I'm going to go to where it says our grounded right here. And we're going to uncheck the grounded. And now you see there's no push pin. So I can actually grab these parts and move them around wherever I want. Those are going to be the parts for our moving jaw. Uh, I'm going to undo a couple times because I do want to keep them together because I'm going to make them into a sub-assembly. And a quick way to do that, I don't have to go up here and join and constrain and assemble these components together. What I can do is I can select those parts. Again, I'm going to hold control, select those components, and I'm going to right click. I'm going to go down to component, and I'm going to say demote. By hitting demote, it's going to turn them into their own group and their own subassembly. So I'm going to click demote. It says, what do you want to name that subassembly? And I'm going to call this moving jaw. Okay, that's going to be our moving jaw. It's going to save it in the same place of our assembly, our vice assembly here. And I'm going to say OK. And it now it tells me it's going to restructure Instead of having these pieces being in between those solids, it's going to restructure it. I'll say OK, and it puts my moving jaw on the bottom here. Now they're all one component that I can move around. I don't have to do all that mates and stuff uh, to remate it and, and make it uh, all components that stuck together. I can easily just make them a sub-assembly. Uh, it looks like my, uh, there we go. Cool. So now what I want to do is I want to now uh, make a, a joint that's going to join these faces together. You can see what's going on with my little 3D mouse here, but I'm going to join these faces together, uh, very similar to the way we use joints inside of Fusion. Uh, Fusion was a little bit more uh, advanced when it comes to making those joints, but um, let's go through that process now. So I want to go up to Joint. I'm going to create a joint. This is our joint interface. And what I want to do is I want to join this center line if you will, 
with this center line of this part. So I'm going to take that inner plane and make it a pivot point. So what I want to do is, uh, instead of I can make an automatic or rigid, we'll talk about that, but I want to take this first point, I want to grab that inner edge right there, and if I do it like this, and I click, now you see that little arrow, if you will, go off the edge of it. And that is giving me the direction, if you will, a z-axis towards another component that I want to join. And then that becomes the center edge of my uh, axes, if you will, or uh, how I want to join them together. So I'll do the same thing on this side, right? So I'm going to grab that same position, the same center axes, and it joined them together. And because they're both heading in the same X, it, it thinks that we want both of them to join in that same direction. Now, it seems a little bit weird, but I want to flip that over so I can easily go over here and I can say flip the component. Uh, that's not quite how I want it to be flipped over, but that's close. That's close to the way. Um, and I can go and I can either make that a rigid joint. I can go back here and I can select that same component. I can always go back and make changes, flip it over. I want to flip it. Uh, actually, I want to mirror it, not flip it like that. I don't know why it's not giving me the mirror, but of course, it's because I'm here. Invert. I don't want to invert. Isn't that wonderful? So I actually want to flip it so it goes in the other direction, not directly in the same position that it was before. So I'm going to go over here. Let me see. Nope, nope, that's not what I want. There we go. And my flip should make it on the other side, not upside down. So I'm going to have to figure out what the heck I'm doing there. Let me try it again. So it's only when you go to show somebody these things. So I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to pick the moving jaw first, right? So I'm going to go up to my joint. Again, I'm going to grab that edge that I want those two faces to face each other, right? That looks right to me. So I'm going to go around to this one. And I'm going to go and grab that same face. There we go. Come on. There we go. Work with me here. I know it's a little bit tedious. Um, and that's why we, we, they spend some time in Fusion to really get this to, to uh, make it easy for you to be able to grab and grasp those different edges. Flip. And I should be able to flip this over. And of course, it's making a liar out of me. I'll say OK. Let me hit Apply real quick. I'll be able to move this and flip it. All right. So if I go into here, now I have this relationship. If I go into that rigid relationship, I can easily edit that relationship. And now I can go and flip it. I can move the components around. I can make it a rotational like this. And I can also make it a slider like this. Now I want to be able to flip that over, so I'm going to grab this again, and I should be able to flip that to the other side. Oh, not quite. Let's try again. Come on, work with me here. I know I'm doing something wrong. You guys can probably chime in and see what I'm doing. If, I, if I'm selecting it wrong, because I've been doing this for, for, good, for a good bit, and it seems to work for me. When I flip that, it generally gives me the other side, doesn't flip it over upside down. So, let me try that again, guys, because I'm probably, it's either me or it could be in the software, but, you know, let's flip this thing around. Let me undo. Generally, I can get it working pretty nicely. Let's try that again. So, I'm going to go into do my joint. I'll grab that same edge. Right? I'll grab this same edge over here, and generally it'll give me the same direction. Why is this one acting up on me a little bit? Nope. I want to rotate that around, guys, like that. Always during a webinar. So I've been doing this, like, uh, quite a bit. What the heck is going on? Let me hit Control. Control can see through. I think that's it. And if we flip it, all right, it's going to make a liar out of me. Anyway, so you guys can probably practice it, get it to work better than I can, of course. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm sure I would like to get some follow-up uh, to this because I can make it a slider quickly and easily. And I can make this thing be able to slide through. It's upside down now. But um, usually I can get my mates working pretty quickly, uh, really easily. It's just something's going on here. Let me go through and escape out of here, delete. So without taking too much time, we're able to do that. Let me undo a few times. We're able, generally able to get it to work as quickly as we can. If I did faces, we can do that as well. So if I did something like this, uh, make a joint on the face as well, 
Now I have a Z going that way, and I'll have a Z going that way, and I can tell it whether it's a rigid joint, a slider joint, that'll work as well. I can also add a gap, and we'll make it, let's say, uh, we'll make it a gap of three inches, something like that, and I can apply. And now I'm able to, to set up the Kurt Vice. Later on, I can add uh, a limit to that. So if we can go in here and edit, if we go to edit, we can see we have limits, and we can start our limit and end our limit uh, for that joint really quickly and easily. So I'm going to leave it like that it's just for this webinar. So uh, when I go back through, I'll see what I did wrong later. And you guys can, again, chime in and help me out and, uh, and go through a good way to, to add those joints in there. So, okay. So what I want to do now is I want to show you, thank you. I think uh, Angelo's telling me to use the top face of the jaw. Yeah. Pick the face point. And that's okay. So I can get a joint like this, and I can use that. It can be a rigid joint. I can also do a slider joint, so I can move this around. And I know um, you can get really good with the type of joints and the constraints where you can actually have this turn the little handle, and you can have it move per tooth, you know, per thread. And you can actually have that move in and out as if it's actually working in the real world. Um, I'm not going to jump into too much of that right now. Uh, I'm going to get a part. I'm going to sit it in here, but I want to give you guys a walk through of how to make it an assembly and be able to apply those joints. And now we're going to bring a part in here and we're going to do some basic tool pass on there. So first thing I want to do is I want to save it. So I'm going to go to save, yes to all, because those are all the bodies we manipulated. I'm going to say OK. And all of those inventor parts are now going to be updated. And now I have them linking to this assembly. So this will be my template. So I can use this over and over again. I have an origin that's sitting on that top corner right there. So if I put in the axis, you could see. And I can always use that origin to touch off later if you want to. Uh, you can put a dowel pinhole, uh, some, some kind of pinhole in your fixed jaw, and you can use that to probe, and that can be your origin as well. Okay, guys, now I'm going to go and get a part. Uh, we can design one, but I'm going to go into, I'm going to expand this. I'm going to go into a website here. Um, I like working with Titans of CNC, their academy. If you guys haven't been here, you got to check out this website. In fact, their program, uh, the Titan and his team are doing, um, are creating not only just how to use CAD and CAM software and machining, they have the whole gamut. They're teaching people how to go from the concept to draw up a part using Fusion um, and being able to get all the way through to machining, setting up a machine, and at the end, uh, it's a great course. They have tons of parts in here that you can look at uh, to work with. You can easily log in, create an account. Uh, so we're going to look at some 3D models. And these you can grab different 3D models that Titan and his team are working with to teach people. And so if we scroll through, I'm going to go down and load. A lot of these are Fusion models, but you can always get them uh, in different versions. Let's, let's do this one. I saw this in the front. Let's grab this part. So I'm going to grab that Titan part. I think I already downloaded this, but that's okay. I'm going to download it again. This looks like a pretty good part that we could fit into our assembly really quickly. So I can get a, a drawing PDF where I can download the model directly. And it brings me into A360. I don't even have to have an account. I can get to this site and download the parts. There's the part we're going to work with. We're going to set it up inside of our vise. And if I go to download, you can see the different file types that Autodesk 360 can translate this part into. So we could do a Fusion archive part to bring it right into Fusion. There's Inventor. So I can download it into Inventor. There's a lot of other types, STL files, step files, um, and these different types you can download. I'm going to get the Inventor part. I'm just going to type in my email. Right? So I enter my email, send it. And in just a second or two, it doesn't take very long, it'll pop up in my email and I'll be able to work with that part. So let me, uh, let me jump into my assembly back into here real quick. And when that downloads, I'll be able to, uh, to bring it into this assembly. And again, since it's an inventor part, I don't have to use any CAD. But if you have a SolidWorks part or a Pro E part, you can open it up, use any CAD, and it'll bring it into your assembly as a translated part. So I just got an email. I'm going to open, and it says that now I can download the file. So now it downloaded it to my, um, my downloads folder. It's called Titan 15. So let's open it up. So I'm going to go to file. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to place it. So I'm going to go up here to place. I'm just going to bring it right into my assembly here. 
So I'm going to say all files. Uh, that's in my AnyCAD workflow, and I'm going to go into my downloads. And I should see down here, that's interesting, uh, my Titan project. There's a Titan part. Open it up. Okay, it's giving me a little bit of a warning. Say it's not in the same project folder. I'll say yes, and now I can place it in here. So if you want to place multiple files, I'm just going to kind of put it somewhat in position. And then I can place multiple of those components. I'm going to hit Escape to get out of there. And now I'm just going to use some assembly mates to put it in place that I want to see this part. Of course, you can draw up or download some parallels, put them in here. Um, you can even uh, you can do a Boolean remove if you ever want to create a soft jaw in here. Uh, just download, you know, update your soft jaws, uh, and then make a put the position, uh, the part in position, and then do a Boolean remove to do that. But in this case, I'm just going to assemble it. So under Relationships, while I'm in the Assemble menu, under Relationships, I'm just going to go into Assemble. I can add joints if I ever want to move this around or have the components work with each other, but I can easily do this. I could say, uh, let's say from this edge, I want this edge to be normal to this face. And now I can add a uh, space in between them. And I think this is, uh, we'll try uh, we'll try 100 thousandths. All right, we'll go half that. We'll go 50 thousandths. And now I can position it. And of course, I can always move my jaw there. But I want to give you an idea. That's how we would position that initially. So I want to add another one. And let's say from the bottom of the part, I want to have that be assembled normal to the top of the jaw there. And again, I can also add uh, some position here. So I can say an eighth of an inch or sixteenth of an inch. So I can have that go a sixteenth of an inch the bottom of the part over, so I can make sure when I'm machining, I'm at least going to machine off the face of what was left in between those jaws there. I'll hit the green check. And uh, again, I can also position it in this, this direction here. So I'm going to go to Relationships Assemble. And again, I can do this from a, from a uh, parallel, or I could do it from an edge of the part. I'm going to position it to that edge there. And again, I can position it, move it over. Um, some distance, whatever I want to put in here. Let's say, you know, want to put two inches. You see it'll move two inches. I'm going to leave it at zero so it's nice and flush. Okay, I'm going to hit apply. And now we're, we're assembled. I'm going to hit the green check. And now it's in position where I want to see it on the model. So really quickly and easily, I'm able to assemble this into my template. And we can set it up to do some uh, machining. Let me see real quick if we have any questions or if you guys are chiming in and showing me how to, uh, the right way to, uh, to add those joints. Cool. So it looks like uh, Mike Matera is chiming in, and, and also Angelo, uh, thanks for uh, giving me some to uh, pointers on, on uh, how to place that part in there. Um, so it looks like, uh, Mike Matera, you're also letting us know that there's some new videos uh, showing how to use the standard fixture components and import them into your job. So awesome. He's got some videos on setting up and creating soft jaws. Um, I don't know if it looks like the whole team is able to see your link. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Mike Matera's link and I'm going to put it into the chat window so that you guys can link directly uh, to be able to see those videos. So thanks for sharing, Mike. Uh, so I put that into the, uh, into the chat window. So for those of you who aren't able to see uh, what's going on in the chat so you guys can reach those links to walk through how to make those uh, soft jaws. So awesome. Thanks, guys. So um, I'm going to keep going. So I have this part in here. So the next steps would be uh, to simply just set it up and get some tool pass on there. So we're going to rough it out, uh, get some code, and uh, come back and maybe we'll make some changes and we'll make some direct edits of the part and, uh, and show you that, that integration between the CAD and CAM side. Okay, so I'm in position. Uh, pretty quickly, I was able to get this assembly uh, in here, and uh, let's go and set it up with some tool paths. So I'm going to switch over to the CAM uh, tab. So we're using Inventor HSM. We don't have a setup yet, so it doesn't give us the CAM browser at this point until we start our first setup. So I'm going to go and click on Setup. So it's real easy working from left to right to be able to set up your model and get started. So I'm going to go to Setup. It created this new Setup tab right here. And now it recognized everything in our graphics view, including the vise. So if you actually wanted to cut out the vise as well, well, this would be the minimum stock you would need to be able to do that. It also positioned our datum here at the top center. 
Um, now, I don't really want to have to cut a big block like that. I just want to cut that one part. So I'm going to exit out of what it selected all the models. I'm just going to simply select that one body, that one model. It shrank down my uh, initial stock size that I would need to cut it out. And it also gave us the position of our, our datum there, our G54. So I can quickly and easily change that datum. If I go over here to stock box point, by default, we're on our stock box. I can select any of these edges off the stock box to become the G54, even in the center. And we might do that because we're going to probe to find the center and the top of the model. So it's really quick and easy to do. Uh, we do have probing now inside of our HSM, inside of Inventor, and we'll walk through that step. Now, if I did want to use, now it would be kind of hard to get to, but if I wanted to use that top corner or another position on my model, I can easily change that to say I want to use the model origin. And it drops down, and this way I can always have the same origin inside this template. I don't have to worry about it. If I often have this Kurt Weiss sitting uh, inside of what, uh, sitting inside of our, our uh, let's say, our, our, uh, our machine very often. Maybe we'll have a pair of Kurt Weisses sitting in there, and we very rarely move them, or they're in a position that's easy to find. We could set that origin up, and it's always going to be the same, so you don't have to ever come down and touch off uh, on, on, the, uh, on the main part or on your fixture. You can always find your G54 quick and easily. Now, if you do want to come down and touch off, of course, on the top of your stock or find out where that is, I would move it back and say stock box point. I can also do selected point. So if we actually had, uh, let's say, the center of that bolt hole, which would be kind of silly, but we can do that if you wanted to, I can also grab a corner back here of the model. So you can always, it's very flexible. You can always find a place on your assembly, on your, on your uh, vice, or on your part. Let's say I want to find a selected point on my part, maybe the center of that hole or an edge, I can easily select that to become our G54. Okay, so I'm going to go back. I want to choose that same box point in the top center. So we're going to probe and find that top center of the part. Uh, now I want to set up my stock size. So I can easily go up into the stock tab, and I can choose whether we're using a relative size box, uh, if we're using a fixed size cylinder or whatever size it is, uh, if I want to do a fixed size box, which means I can just start plugging in the numbers. I can say uh, I want this to be uh, eight and a quarter uh, by three inches, which is what I want. And I can say by uh, inch and three quarter, or I can say two inches. And then it gives me that stock size directly. I could see it grow right in the screen. I don't have to leave this environment. I don't have any boxes sitting on top, so I can't see what my stock size is going to be. And this is great because it gives me a visual confirmation of how the stock is going to be around the part as well as the way it sits inside my vise. If I wanted to leave, let's say, 100 thousandths on top, I'm going to say I want 100 thousandths on top of the model right there, and I can see how much of that stock is going to be now be inside the vise jaws there. And now I can choose the right um, parallels to sit inside of there as well. So it's easy to be able to see that. You can also do relative size box, which means it'll plug in numbers that grow around the, the part itself. So you have some options. If you guys are ever working from uh, near net shapes, if you ever work from uh, forge parts or cast parts, and you can bring that right into this assembly and you can select that solid model to become your stock that you're driving from or you're driving to. So you have that option to be able to select that stock, it becomes your, uh, the solid becomes your stock body. Okay, so I'm going to choose that fixed size box. I actually plugged in some numbers. There's my stock size, and now I'm ready to start machining this away. So I'm going to say okay. First thing I want to do is I want to face off the top to get that nice top face, that edge uh, on there. So I'm going to go up to face. I'm going to do 2D machining, grab a face. We do a nice uh, 3D adaptive face, too. Uh, and we showed that on one of our webinars as well. Uh, quick and easy. Let's do that. Let's, do that. let's, let's have some fun. So I'm going to go up to Adaptive. And I'm going to select a tool. I'm going to grab a face mill out of a library. I'm working in the Haas VF2. Uh, and this is a library similar to the way we worked uh, as uh, the team works in Pier 9. Um, they have a nice library out there, a, a good tool crib for the Haas machine out there. So um, I based this off of that. So I'm going to grab this inch and three-quarter face mill. If I needed to make any changes, I can right-click and I can edit that tool right here on the fly. Uh, any aspects of the tool, the tool type itself, uh, insert, 
the depths or my what's my flute length. I can easily change this, change the holders, holder geometry, the type of holder, feeds and speeds I can update right here. I'll say OK. Select that tool. I can see it come into the graphics view. So I know what the tool is going to look like according to my part. Now I'm doing a 3D adaptive. So if I go into the passes tab, I can see, or I'm sorry, not the passes, this is the geometry. I don't have to change any geometry. I'm going to jump over here to the heights. Now it's going to try to cut because that's what adaptive does. It's going to look at the whole model from top to bottom and apply that toolpath to be able to cut out all those features efficiently. I really don't want to go all the way down to the model with a face mill. What I want to do is I want to go from the top, which is my stock top, down to the model top. Now I have it facing off from wherever it starts on the stock down to the top of the model. Okay, and you can go in here and change your maximum roughing step down. Let's say we're taking a hundred thousandths off. I'm going to go fifty thousandths per step down. So I want two step downs into the material. Yeah, I'm not going to leave any stock, so I make sure I turn off stock to leave. Okay, and I can also tell it uh, my my in my linking parameters how far off the part, or if I want to go in and start my lead in and lead out, I can easily do that here. So I'm going to leave it the way it is. I'm going to say OK, and now I have this adaptive face toolpath. So I'm going to use an adaptive clearing to go around and face off the top of the part. So while I have it highlighted, let's go and simulate. And I can simulate right on the model, and I'd like to see it with stock on it, so I'm going to turn on stock. And now I can see the material it's going to remove off the top of the part, and it's doing that neat adaptive face toolpath using my face mill. So there's the first pass. comes back. I have a nice little chunk right there. So there's the first pass. Hopefully this one will take it off, I think. It might just be graphics. So it didn't look like it took that little chunk off there. It goes right around it. Oh, no. Shoomp. There it goes. Nice. So we're able to face it. I can see the top of the model. I know it faced down to the top of the model there. Okay. Let me expand this out a little bit real quick. I can see if you guys have any comments or any questions you want to add. Again, guys, this is a conversation. If there's anything you guys want to add or, or talk about, I'm realizing we're getting really close to the top of the hour. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to rough out the part, get some code out. So let me close this out. And also, you notice it's showing as if it's just a gray block. I can change this to operation. And now I can color coordinate it. So the next operation we do, it's going to be color coordinated. So let me close out of here. I'm going to do another adaptive clearing. And I want to get in some of these pockets in here. I'm going to clear out those pockets really efficiently. So I'm going to switch over my tool uh, from that face mill. I'm going to go back down to my Haas VF. I'm going to use a quarter flat rougher. Probably, I would probably want to use a quarter bull nose. Let's, let's get pretty big. I'm going to use actually a half inch bull nose to get in there and clean out and rough it out. So I'll select that half inch bull. Okay. I don't have to select anything, right? I'm just going to say OK. It's going to calculate everywhere that tool can go. And this is a good way to work. Instead of getting in there and trying to set all kinds of parameters, right? Just select a tool and see what the tool path is going to do, right? See what you get out of the box. Right? And that looks pretty good. It looks like it's going to remove a lot of those chips. I can always go back and refine. But a good thing is just select the tool and let it go after that material. So and I have a little check right here. So if I right click, it's telling me that check right there saying you have a message. There's something going on, a little bit of a warning. It's not telling me that there's something wrong with the tool path. It's just giving me a warning saying something has changed. So I'm going to right click, go down to show log. And it says rest material, rest material adjustment reduced to maximum limit. So what this is telling me is that when it's recalculating and coming back to remove this material, it's going to re it's going to change my approach so that I don't gouge the model. So it's letting me know that it went back into one of my settings and made a change because it recognized a place where I could have a potential gouge when it recalculates and comes back in for another pass. So I'm going to take a look at what they look like. I'm going to go up to setup. Okay, I'm going to go up to simulate, and we've already seen it do the, the face, so I can either right-click or I can go and say next operation. We don't need to see all that tool pass, so I'm going to turn off and just change it to tail to make it easier for you guys to see. And here it's going to walk, work its way. And it looks like I can probably get a lot deeper because the adaptive clearing works really well when you're using as much of the side of that flute as possible. 
but it's working its way down and I gave it a maximum or uh, a minimum and maximum step down that it can take right so I can speed this up a little bit at least I can see that right here I can see in this simulation that um, I can probably go a little bit of a deeper step down with that tool right so I can always go back and change uh, my operations so now it's working its way around there's that other step down so I can always change that to go a little bit deeper um, but at least we're getting a pretty good efficient toolpath. I can I know I can go back in there and add some efficiency to that toolpath. But let's rough it out real quick. Looking pretty good. And again, if I had any collisions, I can tell it to stop on collision. I can show it to tell it to show transparent so I can see what's happening inside the model. I can see how much stock I'm leaving on the walls right there. I know I'm going to come back later and clean that up, maybe with a pocket or maybe even another adaptive with rest machining, a smaller tool. So I'm going to come back with a horizontal to clean that up, but it's looking pretty good. So all I had to do is select a tool and have it go after wherever it can rough most efficiently. Again, keeping that side of the tool engaged as much as possible, always keeping that same chip load. Right? I have a tapered helix so it gets into that pocket and pulls out those chips, has room for those chips to get pulled out of there. And as you see, it gets into those corners, it always comes back for another bite. So it's not doing the entire um, uh, tool diameter, and I'm not burying the tool. It leaves room to always keep that same size chip being pulled out of there. Therefore, you can run at higher spindle speeds because you're going to transfer that heat that's going from the tool into the material, and you're going to pull that heat out with the chip. So the faster spindle speed you can run, the faster feed, the feed rate you can do, and the faster you're going to get your parts off the machine. And you're going to save tool life. So it's really good adaptive clearing is an awesome strategy to use. So there we go. So we're roughed out those pockets. I'm going to come back real quick. Uh, again, I'm realizing we're getting way close to the top of the hour. So let's do it really quick. So I can, I can copy this adaptive. Or I just wanted to edit. But I can simply copy it. Let's do, a, uh, I'm going to do a horizontal real quick. 3D. Uh, we'll do a 3D horizontal. And I'm going to use a smaller tool just to clean up all those areas. In fact, the horizontal is going to look at all the floors, all the flats on the part that we can get to. Um, and I can easily use that to clean up where I left stock on the floors of the walls. So if I go to my Haas VF2, I'm going to grab, uh, let's say, a 3 8 Actually, that's great. let's get a quarter inch bullnose. We'll go back in there. And then here I could tell it, um, in my geometry, I can give it a boundary. I could say tool orientation. Um, that's OK. I'm going to leave it the way it is. I'm going to say OK. It's going to look at everywhere it can go efficiently to remove uh, those chips off the, 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 uh, the horizontal faces of the part. There it is. It's calculating really quickly. And we'll be able to get into those corners in here and, uh, and remove those chips uh, really quickly. So um, I'm able to get some code out. I just want to show you guys these steps uh, to be able to get the code out and then make some quick changes to the part. It looks like, yeah, we're, at, we're at, actually at the top of the hour. Um, let's get some code. So I'm going to highlight setup one. Okay, I'm going to go up to post process. We can get a pretty good setup sheet, but I'm going to post out. Okay, it should bring up my post dialog wherever that went. There it is. So I'm working on the Haas. I'm going to use my generic post. But we're working on the Haas VF2. So we can actually use the Haas generic Haas uh, post. will work really well to get code uh, out of the box for the VF2. So I'm going to post out. We have some switches we can use. So let's post out the code. I'm going to save it and overwrite that 1001 we already have. And it brings up, here's my HSM edit. And now I can send this code right over to the machine and start cutting this part out. OK, guys, um, I like to make some changes, but I realize that we're at the top of the hour. Hopefully, this has been helpful for you. I just mainly wanted to walk through with you guys on the steps of using AnyCAD, opening up a model, a SolidWorks model, uh, right from the one we downloaded directly from the internet, uploaded it into into uh, Inventor, and uh, was able to change that model, orient it using direct, this direct design up here. Well, I'm in the assemble, but I was using the direct um, modeling, uh, being able to to maneuver it, move it around, put it in position that I want to see that. We're able to go into assembly. I showed you how to create the assembly right in here. So we did. The 3D model, we used direct, right? And then we made an assembly out of it. I went into manage, and we said make components. 
and we create an assembly out of that multi-body model. In the assembly, I was able to add some joints, probably not very successful as you guys would be, but I was able to add some joints to make this a moving jaw. I did make a joint to make it, uh, to put a gap in between. I can easily change that joint. And uh, I was able to download a part and definitely check out Titan's uh, website. Go to Titans of CNC Academy and check out those parts. Check out what they're doing. They have some amazing videos in here of what people are doing and, and, uh, and what they're learning from his academy. So check this out. You can download some parts just like we did. I was able to download that, that part right here, brought it right into Inventor, and we put some tool pass on it and got code that we can run in the machine right now. So guys, that was the steps I wanted to show you guys today. Uh, tune in. Um, we have the Wednesday webinars where we cover a lot. Uh, next week, we're going to have, um, uh, I think we're going to have Kalita Racing with us. If not Kalita Racing, we invited uh, Kurt Chan with a few guests as well. Uh, Kurt will be here with us. Uh, in the future, we also have Angelo, who is with us today. Angelo is going to be on uh, to show us some of the projects he's working at, on in Pier 9. Uh, Xander is going to come back and show us what he's doing on that uh, post-processor editor, uh, the simplified editor. So it's exciting to see some of the projects he's been working on at Pier 9 as well. Team Kalita, uh, Kalita as I said, will be here. Uh, Kevin Lee in the future. Uh, Kevin is uh, Leverage Engineering, uh, or Leverage Integration, and uh, he does a lot of machining projects, and he's going to talk to us about some of the projects. We have a lot more up and coming. So tune in each week. Uh, join us, and we're going to get uh, deeper into more machining and deeper into our integrated CAD and CAM interfaces. So with that, guys, thanks for joining us. Hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, you guys who are out there using Inventor HSM, I hope this helps. Uh, to get you guys uh, on that process of, of bringing in your assemblies, bringing in your parts, being able to um, to uh, uh, work with them. Uh, that's funny. Uh, I see Curtis uh, Bussy. I see his comment here where I was I was having some trouble with the uh, with the assembly, and he said, "Oh, it looks like it's an operator problem." So that, that pretty much is it. So guys, please join us each week. Uh, every Friday we'll be here, and um, we're going to teach and uh, show more of what's going on in our awesome community of um, CAD CAM users as well as machinists. So thanks guys, and uh, we'll see you next week.